Welcome to Section 2 of the Get Ready Marin course. In this segment, we learn about preparing before a disaster happens. Tiburon firefighter Dean Bonfili is our presenter. Once again, it might not always be the perfect scenario where you're sitting at home, in bed, perfectly protected in your body armor that you have at home. Um, you might be out on the road, you might be at work, so how can you be prepared to deal with a disaster during these times? I love this picture. Um, this is someone's trunk, and she's obviously way prepared. You take a, I don't know how many people have their trunk with all this, all this sort of thing in it that she has here, but um, keep in mind an emergency kit, some first aid supplies, maybe a few power bars. Um, if, you're, if you're a lady who works somewhere where maybe you have high heels, maybe you want to throw a pair of tennis shoes or running shoes in your car. That way, should you have to leave your car on your way home, you can put something comfortable on to help you walk the rest of the way. Um, they also talk about keeping some cash in your car. I'm terrible about this. Change anytime I need a soda or I stop by, I need a, a, something to drink, something to eat here or there. I, I'm looking through the cushions, finding all the change and money in my car that I might leave. But it's a good idea. The electricity goes out, ATMs go out, all of a sudden cash becomes a commodity. If you have some set aside, it can always help you in the time of need. So keep that in mind. Also good to have that in your home as well in your emergency kit. Um, on pages seven and eight, in the manual, we have a couple of lists for you, some emergency supplies um, that are things to think about, um, some mini survival kits that you can have at work or in your car. I'm not gonna go through all of those, but I might take an opportunity right now to just show you some of the things that we recommend, um, some of the things that might be helpful. Um, in terms of hardware, utility knives, um, they call Leatherman tool, utility knife, multi-purpose tool. Has everything in here from a can opener to a corkscrew to a knife to some pliers. Always good to have. Small, easy to access. This pair of utility scissors, we use these in the fire service all the time. Um, you can cut a penny with these. They're very inexpensive, very lightweight, and very indestructible. So, good pair of scissors to have. Can opener, we're telling you to have things that won't spoil, things that won't go bad. It'd be terrible if you had 52 cans of tuna fish in your emergency kit and you didn't have a can opener. So keep in mind the things that you have. Now you see this wonderful five gallon bucket. It can be used for a number of things. Um, one, you can put all the supplies in it and use it as a, as a storage or a carrying unit. But at the same time, you can purchase this wonderful toilet seat. Okay. And then all of a sudden your five gallon bucket can do a lot more than just carry supplies for you. Um, one of the things to think about though is getting some liners. They make wonderful toilet bag liners, if you will, for a five gallon bucket. Or just something simple like some garbage bags can go in there. Um, you take care of what you need to take care of. You don't want to flush this right down the toilet because there might be some problems with sewer lines. So what we recommend is burying it if you can for the time being until the disaster ends, if you will, and you can take care of things after that. So, um, just a few supplies. Batteries, extra batteries, some toilet paper, wonderful things to have. Some good sturdy gloves, you never know, there could be broken glass, there could be uh, twisted metal, broken wood, anything that protect your hands, very important. Everybody knows what duct tape is. Duct tape, 100 mile an hour tape, I think they used to fix helicopters with this in the war in the Persian Gulf, so it's pretty indestructible, can be used for a lot of different things. One of the great things that they've come up with, and we talked about a multi-purpose tool, well, here's a multi-purpose unit, which is a flashlight, but it's a radio, and it's also uh, solar powered, but it also can be wound up, so you don't really need batteries to go with it. So um, there's a lot of neat little tools out here that you can have in your emergency kits to help you in times of need. Talked a little bit about knowing where you, your utilities are, your gas, your electric, and your water. Do you know how to turn them off? That's a really, really important question to ask because you might say, hey, I know where it is, but I, I've lived in my house for 30 years and I've never opened up the little box that the water thing sits in and I don't know. There could be all kinds of things in there besides the shutoff valve. Little creatures could make it home. There could be tons of mud, dirt, debris, all kinds of things could be um, in there. So it's a good idea. And like I said, it's a homework assignment for you. Go home, 
find where all these are and try to access them so that you can get hands on them. I'm not telling you to go home and shut your water off. That's not a good thing. I'm not telling you to go home and shut your gas off. We'll talk about that later because you can't just turn it right back on. Um, but know where they are and be able to access them. Those are very important things. Your gas utility. Okay, if the gas is turned off, do not turn it back on. You have to contact PG&E in this area to come back on and turn your gas back on. And the earthquakes that took place down in Northridge, there was an earthquake, the huge earthquake hit, everybody went outside, shut their gas off, and all of a sudden now pe the people down there, there was about 15,000 calls in one day to come turn their gas back on. Yes, you could turn it back on, but there could be a problem. There could be gas leaking, um, and so you're putting yourself definitely in harm's way. So they're saying we want professionals in there to turn it on for you. There's different tools that you can use to shut off your gas. If you look at the picture um, that we have on the screen, it shows a crescent wrench. A crescent wrench can be used. Um, they also make special tools that you can buy at your hardware store. Have them in your emergency kit um, is one place. But at the same time, we're going to recommend possibly hanging it off the, the gas utility itself. Um, Here's a, a wrench that has a number of different uh, holes in it. Now, the one thing that's kind of tragic here in this situation is not all gas shutoff valves are the same size. So if you just go buy one of these, make sure you can go home and it fits on your gas valve. Don't just assume that it's going to fit. Um, and the other thing to do is possibly just crack it a little bit. Crack your gas valve just a little bit to make sure it turns. A lot of these have been installed 30, 40 years ago and they've never been touched. If you go home and it's rusted into place or weatherized into place, you can contact PG&E, they'll come out and they'll exchange it for free. That's something that we've heard people have done lately um, because obviously they want it to work just as much as you want it to work and need it to work. If you have a crescent wrench like what's pictured in the video or on your screen right now, make sure that it's opened to the spot that fits the size of the gas valve. Okay, if it's all the way closed or all the way open and all of a sudden you hang it outside on the gas meter and the weather that we have here rusts it into place and it's not open into the position to fit your gas valve, all you have then is a real expensive window breaker. It won't do you any good. So try to make sure that everything is fit so that if you do keep it outside, all you have to do is access it, put it on the valve and turn it off. Know where your electrical panels are. Uh, most of the homes these days have a breaker panel. Find them outside. You'll also find some of them inside your house, particularly in the kitchens, um, behind refrigerators. If you have a big Viking stove ovens, uh, they'll usually find uh, breaker panels for those as well in the house. But know that outside the house or in the garage is where you, where you will find your main breaker panel. Breaker panel. So just make sure you know how to access that. Okay. Older homes possibly will have fuse boxes very similar to a breaker box. Um, just understand how to unscrew a fuse and screw a new fuse back into place. One thing on here I think is a very valuable tool they tell you. They say to label the circuits. Okay, you have a breaker panel outside your home. It's got 15 or 20 little breakers in there and they're not labeled. All of a sudden you need to know how to shut something off because you have to change this or that. Label them. Go through your house, make sure you know, hey, this is for the dishwasher, this is for the washing machine, these here are for all the lights in the front room, these are for all the outlets in the house, so on and so forth. It'll make it that much easier. In times of distress, the last thing you want to have to do is scramble around turn everything off to try to find uh, the one that you need. Two types of water shutoff valves to be aware of. Uh, the one on the right you see is sort of a hand knob. Those will usually be, be found real close to your home, if not right on the outside of your home, on the base foundation of your home. Um, righty tighty, lefty loosey, that's usually what we like to say. That'll be how you uh, can shut the water off, not from the street, but you can shut it off from going into your home. Okay? Some homes don't have these. If your house doesn't have this, the way to shut the water off, you'll have to go out to the street and you'll find a box like you see on the picture on the left. That'll be down in the ground. Okay? And so to shut off the, the water to your home, you'll need to access that panel out on the street. Very similar to shutting the gas off. Um, there'll be a valve. It'll look much like your gas valve. Turn it to the right to shut it off. Righty tighty. Lefty loose. Preparing yourself in your home. Um, we're going to talk about structural and non-structural hazards in your house. 
Structural hazards, not everybody's an engineer. We're not expecting you to be able to look at the foundation and know all the different things that are happening in your home like a, a, a structural engineer would. But at the same time, we're asking you to do some simple things. We want you to imagine that your house is on wheels. And during an earthquake, it's rolling down the street. And things are going left and right, up and down. Okay. Understand what could possibly hurt you in this scenario. What could possibly go wrong? Do you have an old brick fireplace? Maybe it's going to get loosened up. This could be a problem. Maybe your, your house is on a hillside and you have a very interesting foundation or pylons holding up your home. These are things that could be damaged during an earthquake. Um, if you have any questions, you might want to contact a licensed engineer. They can come out and give you some help, some assistance with that. Also, uh, you can work with your local city uh, building officials. They might be able to help you um, as well. For more information, have got a website up there um, if you need to contact that. Non-structural hazards. These are more of the things that we think you can address because they're visual and they're easy to take a look at, they're easy to see. Possibly you have a hanging plant right by a big plate glass window. Okay. Earthquake comes, plant starts to swing, smash into the window. Now you have more than one problem. Not just a swinging plant that could knock you out, but now you have broken glass everywhere. Plus you've opened up your house to the outside environment. That can cause some problems as well. Um, things to ask yourself. What in the room could fall during an earthquake? Most of the injuries that occur during earthquakes are people hit by falling objects. Walk through your house, look up high. What could fall down and hit me if I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time? Um, bolt it to the wall, strap it to the wall, retrofit it. They make a lot of wonderful little brackets, gizmos and gadgets that you can use to hold big book bookcases up to the walls. And we're not telling you just buy a bracket and find anywhere on the wall and put it into the wall. You want to make sure that it's secured to a stud inside the wall. Okay, they also make little stud finders, which are very easy to use. Put it on a wall, tell you where um, the beams are inside your wall that you can secure these uh, the brackets to. Preparing yourself in your home. It's on page 15 and 16. The fact that you're in here taking this class, is that's a great thing. You're starting to get trained. But if you'd like to take it to the next level, there's plenty of opportunities for you to do so. You can contact uh, the American Red Cross, you can contact the American Heart Association. They teach some first, first aid training courses. Um, there's also CERT training that's provided by many of the fire departments in the county, um, which will basically take all this information we're giving to you and kick it up to the next level, teach you more. It's a 10-hour course, teach you more on what to do in case of emergency, give you even more preparation.